Hello everyone, we're happy that um, you can join us. This is our first ever CCF Vancouver Zoom event. Um, we're glad that you're able to join us wherever you are, um, in your homes and um, you know, whichever part you are in Canada or maybe outside of, of Canada. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, event today and our topic is Thriving Through the Storm, How to Weather a Canadian Recession. And um, just a quick introduction to myself. My name is Ria, and I am a CCF member. And um, really looking into when I heard about this topic, I thought, wow, what a very timely topic that we're now going through a pandemic. But together with that is we're also going through a financial crisis. And many of us are in different stages financially and have been affected in different ways financially. So just a very apt um, topic that we can just discuss together. I'll pass it on to my co-host, Mark, and then um, Mark can also introduce um, our speaker for today. Thanks, Ria. So just a short intro introduction about myself. My name's Mark, and I'm a father of four kids. So I have a newborn, two months today. And uh, yeah, um, talk about crisis moment. Uh, so I think this is really a good topic to talk about because uh, money is really one thing that people have in mind a lot and fight over a lot. So hopefully um, we can gain some wisdom from it. And um, yeah, just to do a short introduction about our speaker today. Uh, his name is Jason Rose. He's joining us from Montreal. Can a little wave, Jason? Hope everything is well in Montreal. Uh, Jason actually worked for two years at Scotia Bank as a financial advisor, he was helping clients handle their finances from budgeting through university to purchasing their homes, saving for retirement, and even planning their estate. During that time, Jason worked towards achieving his CFA designation. So that's Chartered Financial Account or Analyst. Uh, and he successfully wrote his level two exam last year, which is super hard. So. Uh, so, Jason, maybe you can tell us uh, what you've been up to since then. For sure, Mark, and thanks again so much for having me. Um, so last year, as I prepared to write my second level of my CFA exam, I felt the Lord calling me to pause my career and join work with Power to Change, also known as uh, Campus Crusade for Christ International, to serve the Lord for a year in the Arab world. As I was doing this, um, COVID-19 hit, and uh, we actually had to return home. Uh, the Lord has provided us opportunities to continue serving um, through digital means, um, even as we prepare to take the next steps in our career. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think we'll um, go ahead and um, really dive into our topic in here. Um, thank you, Jason, for that introduction. And, um, you know, we're glad to see you here. Um, back safe and um, it's good to have uh, you know the Lord open opportunities for you um, you know since you've come back from uh, for, from your um, ministry and um, so I'll just dive in and I think you know we are in um, we are in discussion of the economic fallout um, due to COVID-19, due to this pandemic and, you know, um, different things with the crisis and including the lockdown, many businesses have closed. Um, and in that as well, many of us that are employed have been affected. And um, how should we as Canadians plan to get through whatever is going to come next? Yeah, that's a great question, Ria. Um, this, this crisis has really shaken the world. Um, right now in Canada, the unemployment rate has hit 14% and it continues to rise. Uh, various companies are going bankrupt. Canada's uh, federal debt load has actually almost hit a trillion dollars. The markets um, have endured a correction, and, but actually a lot of investors are worried that they're going to crash a second time. Um, there's never anything guaranteed in, in economics, but the signs are pointing towards an economic slowdown that's actually comparable to the 2008 recession. 
in this dialogue, I really wanted to put an emphasis less on like a countrywide recession, a Canada-wide recession, and a bit more on the personal recessionary struggles that each of us might endure. Um, even if Canada doesn't officially undergo a recession, for a lot of us, it's going to feel as if we are in that recession. Um, each of us, we, we, we might lose our job. Maybe, maybe you already have. Um, you, you might feel financially tight or struggle with anxiety or sleep. Uh, the future might seem really dim and you might not even want to think about money at all. Uh, those who, are work, who, who were working in 2008 know how deeply an economic slowdown affects our well-being. A recession is marked by high unemployment, market pessimism, and a fear for the future. So with that being said, with all this stuff coming at us, I, I really wanted to offer a different perspective, a fresh look at the situation. Um, there's this proverb in the, in the Bible that I love to, to, to look at when things get really dark. Um, let me just find it. It's uh, Proverbs, um, Proverbs 18, verse 17. It says, in a lawsuit, the first to speak seem right until someone comes forward and cross-examines. And so just, just to say, um, that's what's coming at us right now, but let's take a different look at this. When I offer my clients financial advice, I like to offer them a way to understand the situation, to grasp both the simplicity and the complexity. Once we have a handle on, on, on the right perspective, we can, we can look at it afresh and make the necessary decisions with confidence. Coronavirus and the fears of, about the upcoming recession have had their chance to plead their case, a case of fear and a case of despair. Um, again, another Bible verse that I just love um, is actually in 2 Timothy um, chapter 1, verse 7. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want to encourage each of us to look at the situation with wisdom and a perspective of hope. I want to highlight a few of the many passages in the, spot, in, in the Bible that discuss this perspective, the perspective that we need to have, and just demonstrate both, also the Bible's relevance today. Thanks, Jason, for that. Uh, I like what you said about um, finding sim simplicity in this all this complexity. And uh, yeah, Apple put it the right way, right? Make things simple and all is... Uh, Gadgets are all simple, but they're they're making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And also, um, what you discuss about wisdom and hope is something that uh, I'm I'm very very much interested in. So, is it possible for you to tell us more about uh, how we can employ this wisdom through this economic downturn? Yeah, for sure. That, that's my goal today. <laughs> Um, I'd actually like to break down our responses to this crisis into three distinct steps. Um, these three steps are first preparing, then protecting, and finally pulling forward. I'm going to share the general characteristics of each step, um, followed by some biblical wisdom, and then a practical illustration. And then I'm going to finish each step with some quick tips on how to apply it in, in each of our lives. I'm going to be using distinct examples to illustrate each step, but the key is to grasp the overarching concepts as they're all translatable to each of our unique situations. To start with the first step, the first step is preparing. Um, preparing is uh, the good news. Many of us are not yet in a precarious situation. Um, with the government support, many of us still have our jobs, or if we've lost them, at least we're still co uh, collecting the beneficial government support. While we remain in this situation, as temporary as it is, we are in a time of preparation. Uh, we, can, we can lay in the groundwork now with the resources we still have uh, to prepare for the tough season ahead. It is not too late. Um, a great biblical example of preparing for a difficult time is actually found in the story of Joseph. Uh, in the Old Testament, God helps um, this man Joseph interpret dreams that warn of an upcoming seven-year famine. Joseph then advises the Pharaoh of ancient Egypt to prepare by storing food for those difficult years ahead. Those years of preparing were crucial and actually saved millions from starvation. So what does this look like for you? Um, here's an example. Take, take the example of a graduating student with a locked in job. Often when you get the offer letter, you stop applying, you quit looking, <laughs> you're set to go. But in this economy though, that would be unwise. Jobs are disappearing fast and the company might simply rescind his offer. 
the best way to prepare might be to have an alternative position ready should the first um, job fall through. And even better, staying in close touch with the hiring manager, keeping yourself in the front of their minds helps them keep you as a priority uh, for them to hire. A, a few uh, key preparation techniques that I would suggest would be um, just to shore up your relationship with your boss. If you're working, make sure you don't have anything between you. Um, continue working hard, continue being uh, in his positive mind. Uh, put some money aside and reduce any debts that you have. Don't blow this financial release, relief that you're receiving, but instead keep building up that emergency fund. Uh, discuss opportunities with your banking advisor. Go see him or her and, and, and discuss ways to, to cut unnecessary costs. Dig, into, dig deeply into your relationship with God. Um, this is really important. God can be your financial, uh, not your financial support. God can be your support and, uh, and he will actually be a rock for you during this time. Discuss your situation with your family and show them love in this stressful time. Those are a few of the things that came to mind, but I would encourage you even now to be thinking ahead and looking for key ways that you can prepare for whatever time there is to come. Thank you, Jason. And you know what? I absolutely agree with the concept, um, kind of your first step of preparation. Um, you know, I don't, none of us have the crystal ball. We don't know what's to come and what, you know, what, what is next. Um, we can speculate and things, but at this time is, this is the time for preparation and not being passive. And, um, you know, I like what you said. Yeah. Doing the groundwork right now. Um, and I, I think about some of your techniques of building your relationships with your boss, building your relationship with your colleagues. You know, it's, it's so true. We're all, I mean, for some of us working from home and the dynamics of, um, work has changed, but we can still build those relationships through, you know, digitally and um, keep those relationships strong. Um, I also appreciate um, just on the financial side of things. And I'm thinking, you know what, this is the time where I can save a little bit more. I have less um, expenses monthly in terms of transportation. I'm, I'm not driving. I'm not taking the bus to work. And some of that money I can just set aside and keep for um, an emergency fund or continue building on that. So, so thanks, Jason, um, for kind of giving us our, the first um, concept and first step. Now, um, could you talk about the second portion, your second rem recommendation? You talked about um, um, protecting. Could you expand on this one? Yeah, for sure, Ria. Um, and also some great, some great ideas already for yourself for preparing. You're right, the next step is protecting. While there is an aspect of preparing, um, that, that begins in the preparation phase. I mean, all these steps can in, interlap and you might not even be able to start with step one, but uh, this one does cross over a bit um, because protecting generally begins in earnest when the first waves of your personal financial crisis hit. Um, I like the illustration of a ship in the ocean. When the storm hits and you need stability, you find that in dropping the anchor and that put, puts a pause on the damage to your ship. It, it really stops you in its tracks and lets you recover, lets you stabilize. So once you hit the stage, the idea is to stabilize and then to regroup. The stage is marked by cutting costs, effectively downsides in your life. It's gonna mean making hard choices, probably really hard choices to prioritize what actually matters. Sacrificing the short term for the long term. Um, now important note, while cutting costs is crucial and it's an important aspect of protecting, it's not the emphasis you want to take. The goal is to preserve and to protect what really matters. So you can't cut what, so, so therefore you cut what isn't important. The key mistake that people make here is that they don't go far enough. They aren't serious and they don't want to lose things that they enjoy. I mean, it makes sense. I, I want to have fun too. But if you cut too shallow, you have to cut even deeper later on and you put the things you really care about at risk. This process will hurt, but it is essential. Uh, Jesus actually speaks on his concept in Mark 8.36. In Mark 8.36, he says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world 
and yet forfeit their soul. Jesus was speaking on was speaking regarding eternity, yet this vision is true regarding any long-term versus short-term balance. Uh, an example of what protecting this looks like in practice um, would be, say, a 40-year-old man with a full-time job and three kids. Um, he then loses his job at his firm because of COVID. Um, he identifies as his protection priorities, his family, his RRSP savings, and his kids' RESPs. Therefore, he confidently pivots and sells the car, <laughs> sells the second car, cancels Netflix, and then reduces his phone bill. He keeps going until his expenses are less than his income. He also uses his severance package that he gets from losing his job to reduce his debts. And then he keeps a small emergency fund in case things get worse. Uh, this man then takes the extra time and invests into his young family, spending time with his wife and, wife and kids, giving them the stability that he finds in, in the Lord. Um, this man has really prioritized things that matter and gone rid of the things that don't matter. It's incredibly important in this section to ensure that your priorities are well set. If not, you will cut the wrong things. Don't hesitate to put each expense on the table and analyze what value they bring to your family's long-term goals. Invest into what doesn't fade, into relationships, your family, your community, and your relationship with the Lord. Everything else is just temporary. You can always get it back again. Some practical ideas for protecting would be to, really important, to just delay major purchases. If you can, if you're not locked in yet, Step back, hold off, wait a bit, see what happens. You don't know when you might lose your job, when you might not. Um, an important thing if you have a mortgage is just to discuss with your banker the options of restructures or refinancing. Um, this is where they take a look at, at finding a different way to look at your debt to reduce your monthly payments and make it more manageable. Uh, communicate clearly with your spouse and also with your kids about the financial situation. Like I said before, a lot of people don't want to talk about money. But if we don't talk about it, it doesn't make the problem go away. Be clear with your spouse, be clear with your kids and help them take these hard but important steps together. Ask yourself what's necessary, what's not necessary. I've actually outlined my budget that way. I have my necessary expenses and my unnecessary expenses. And those ones are the first to go. Uh, and look for any way to reduce recurring bills, especially. Um, some big ones are your phone bill. Uh, car insurance, if you're not using your car very much, maybe reduce your car insurance, um, uh, other things like that. Find, find ways to reduce those monthly bills. Again, before starting to cut, have an honest discussion with your family about the family's financial position, and then you can work together and looking together for ways to reduce expenses. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah, I learned a lot. I took out a lot of notes. So... I find that repeating some of it will help us because we, it's so dense that I just want to digest and chew on it. So I like the example of uh, being like a ship. If there's a storm, then you got to drop anchor. But if your anchor is not anchored on the right thing, then it might also float away as well. So I like that. And that's something for me to think deeper about on where, where I put my anchor on. Um, for me, uh, I always use the hand example for prioritization. I don't know if um, you guys know it. It's, it's putting God first, then my role as a spouse, then my role as a parent, so my kids next, and then my work, and then ministry. So when I try to really think about um, what's most important, then I look at it through that lens, and hopefully that helps people take a look at where they can cut costs. Oftentimes, it's it's the opposite for people, right? It's it's me first, me next, and me third. <laughs> so it's like I don't want to give up my wants, but as you said, um, we gotta we have to sacrifice. It's 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 a time for us to really take a hard look at our spending, our relationship with money, our relationship with our the most important people in our lives, and and prioritize them. Um, some of the things that people might not want to do is cut off Netflix, right? Netflix is so popular. It really tries to drown us out from what's happening out in the world and, and get into the Netflix world. But yeah, we're, we're number one, we're paying for it. We're spending a lot of time on it, but are we using our time wisely? 
right? Maybe it, it might be better spent with our spouse or our kids or your partner or your parents or whoever it is. So really, um, protecting is very important, but only if you focus on what's really important, which is number one, let's not forget, it's God number one. And finally, what, uh, what resonated with me was that it's important to communicate, be honest, face reality, and don't go into a bubble and say, no, it's going to blow over, it's going to be fine. Um, it, the truth is there, and we have to face it. This is, this is what we have to do so that we can survive the storm. If we don't, then we just say that, oh, it's too late, we're going to sink. So once we prepared, now we protect, and I'm looking forward to your third one. What's the third step? Yeah, the next step is actually to pull forward. Um, this is actually my favorite step because it marks the difference between surviving financial hardship and thriving in financial hardship. You can survive with the first two steps, um, preparing, protecting, but it's the pulling forward that lets you thrive even in this, this situation. Uh, the goal of this step is to see how you can benefit from this time of functional displacement and position yourself to be better off. Ask yourself, what opportunities does this crisis present you with? How can you make yourself more employable? Or even what time investments do you want to pursue with all this extra time that you have on your hands? Countless amazing companies have started because their founders got fired and decided to pursue a new idea. Don't waste this time, but put it to work. Pursue projects or small business ideas. Deepen your learning. Take time to learn a new skill. Continue also to remember what really matters in the end. Invest into your kids' spiritual walks. Invest into your relationship with your spouse. Spend time with the Lord. Grow in your prayer life. Read through the Bible. Be prepared for the Lord to even show you a new direction for your life to follow. And be ready to trust Him with that, actually. Consider even being generous during this time, both with your limited finances and with your uh, extra time. Is the Lord asking you to address uh, specific areas of disobedience in your life? Is he strengthening you for future challenges ahead? Those are all questions I love to ask. And yeah, it's just really important to, to think of how can we make the most of this time. Those that truly succeed in the period of crisis are those that can look beyond that crisis, really gain vision and strive forward. Um, there's a verse in uh, First Chronicles 12, uh, 32, where it says, um, I say got it right here. It's list, list, listing different uh, groups of people who have sent armies to go help David. And um, from Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. Um, so like I said, in this time, King David was gathering armies and many people came from all the tribes. But from Issachar, they sent leaders who had vision and who could use resources wisely. These leaders understood the times and knew what to do. They didn't just send soldiers who had, were just people who could fight. They sent people who were leaders, people who had vision. Be a man from Issachar. Don't panic, but understand the times and act accordingly. The way you can pull forward really depends on the situation you're in. For my situation, as an as unmarried single guy who's looking at new employment this summer, I'm starting to learn how to code Python so I can be more employable in my next career move. I'm taking some extra time each weekend to practice and I purchase an online course for just $20 to learn the basics. That's just one way that I'm trying to pull forward. Uh, here, here's some pull forward ideas that I thought that you can think of um, and add to them as well. Uh, first, build into your skill set. Create new skills that you didn't have before. It can be, these can be skills that you've seen that would be valuable to you in the job that you had or that you still have. Or they can be skills that would help you make a lateral move into a different type of job, a better job. Discuss with your financial advisor the possibility of investing extra cash that you might have on hand into the markets um, while they remain at these bottom levels. Uh, do this wisely with your financial advisor in the way that makes sense with your knowledge. Um, you, it'd be a good time to network and position yourself in the best way possible for this next step. I'm horrible at networking, but reaching out to a few colleagues you've known over the years and just saying, hey, um, I'm looking for a new job um, or I'm looking to expand my horizon. What would you suggest or have you heard anything? Try out a new hobby that will add time, uh, that will add value to your personal life. 
So with this extra time that you have, look at maybe you can learn a new skill or learn something you really enjoy doing. It doesn't have to be for the money. It could just be to help both your mental health, but also you to enjoy life more. Invest into your physical health and get in shape. This is one I need to say to myself. <laughs> um, invest time into loving and, and discipling your family. Again, I'm repeating this again and again, but, but with yourself surrounded by your family, this can be a really, really good and important time. And finally, and I would say even most importantly, invest into your walk with the Lord. How many of us have said, oh, I don't have time this morning, I have to get to work? Or, Well, those excuses are gone. Spend time with the Lord. Invest in that. The goal is to leave this crisis stronger than you were before. You need vision, motivation, and a solid foundation to do that. Invest into what matters and keep an eternal perspective. That's it for my three steps. But I think now we're going to proceed to a time of uh, questions and answers. Yeah, Jason, thanks for, you know, really sharing with us your um, concept of those three steps and how we can really um, prepare during this crisis, protect, and also how to move forward. And many things like Mark make, made notes, I made lots of notes as well about ideas on how we can build on ourselves. You know, taking classes, that's a great one. Um, learning new skills, new hobbies, networking. And I wonder how do we network at this time, but reaching out to people that um, um, we've worked with before, friends we've worked with in the past, I think some probably are wanting some, you know, some, some of these relationships and are hungry for these um, connections as well. So um, physical, the physical being healthy physically, yes, I absolutely agree with that as well. I, I find myself because I, you know, pretty much at home the whole day and I have to pull myself out and take walks um, in the afternoon. And so it's true, you know, I can get into the couch and it was mentioned earlier by Mark about, you know, we can go through and scan through Netflix, but you know, really getting out there. And most of all is investing time with family and with the Lord. And, uh, you know, true, no more excuses that I'm too busy. I have this and I have that. You know, we have the time right now. We're at home. We're together with our families. Um, you know, I don't need an extra hour to get to work. Um, I have that extra hour to myself that I can really build on, um, you know, my prayer life. So very practical steps, Jason. Thank you so much. And um, as you've mentioned, I think we are in our time of Q&A. So um, we'll take some time to our, for our um, viewers today and allow them to post in their questions. I think through the chat room is the best way. Um, just send in your questions and we'll collate them together and we'll have time, more time with Jason to share with us and touch on some of the topics that you wanted um, more to be answered. Well, before that, Maria, thanks for those insights and wisdom. Um, do host, uh, can host ask questions as well? Oh, true. Mm. I, we have the mic, Mark, and okay. I, I think we should. <laughs> yeah, what, what struck me most about that last part, which, which is actually three Ps, right? So it's easier for us. So first is preparation, protection, and pull forward. So I like, I like it makes it a lot easier for my poor memory to remember. But what struck me most is your last comment on investing more into our walk with the Lord. And can you expound on that a little bit more, Jason? For sure, Mark. I think, um, well, I'll use myself as, a, as an example. Um, for a long time, I have struggled to maintain the discipline to have daily time where I spend um, reading the Bible or praying. Um, or, or listening to, to what God has to say. And one of the ways that the Lord has really blessed me uh, during this whole um, time of displacement where I got pulled out of the place I was working uh, very drastically uh, and replaced back in Canada, um, and then in quarantine for two weeks while I 
waited to see if I had coronavirus or not, um, was that every day um, I was able to take time and really spend it listening to God and reading the Bible and praying. And this has really, uh, yeah, it's really been able to, to shape my perspective on this. Um, for a bit of time, I was struggling with anxiety, uh, with feelings of claustrophobia, um, being stuck in the country that I was in, uh, worried about stuff. And now when I was back, um, I felt that in the time I was spending with the Lord, the Lord was starting to show me areas that I had misplaced my identity, areas that I had allowed that to be built into things like um, the ministry I was doing, the work I was doing, the relationships I built, um, uh, the position I held. But when I was coming back to the Lord, I realized that he was taking those things away from me and he was actually giving me himself. I had a chance to receive from the Lord. And so every person I'm talking to these days and saying, look, God is putting a pause on your life right now. This is a scary situation. This is a hard situation. Uh, this is the economy we're talking about. We're not, I haven't even barely mentioned coronavirus, which is scary in itself. But this is also a chance for us to say, God, what are you trying to show me? Is there anything that I have not been listening to about? Has there been anything that I have not been um, faithful to you in? And, and really turn back to him, spending time with him. That was what I, I think I meant by, by really taking advantage of this time and re-centering ourselves on the Lord. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jason, for clarifying that. And really, I, I resonated with what you said about identity. So who, who we are really. And I find that a lot of people in this uh, trying times is a lot of fear. And uh, people are looking for hope. And um, going back to our example of a ship looking for the right anchor, um, can you share with us more wisdom on that, on where we should really put our anchor or our foundations in? Yeah, I think that, um, I think these simultaneous crises, the economy and, and this virus have shown a lot of us that the anchors that we thought were solidly placed uh, weren't. Um, and so even as we really try to cast throughout our anchor and, and stop our, our ship from moving and have a chance to breathe, I think it's important to, to, to reflect on that. Um, were you depending on your health to, to, to pull you through? Well, that, that might not be something you can depend on. It shouldn't be something you can depend on. I don't have the verse, but everyone in the Bible talks about how we are like grass. We will live a, a relatively short life compared to all of history, and then we'll be gone. And yeah, we have memories, but those will even fade away too. We, we, we can't depend on our health. Um, a lot of us depend on our money, uh, depending on our savings accounts, our, our, our RSP, our retirement, right? And suddenly those are being pulled from our feet. And like I said, every time that we face fear, I think that that's a demonstration that, that we starting to feel that the anchor might not be as solid as we thought it was. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is solid? Where can I find that, that rock that won't move? And I, I, I found that in Christ. I don't always put my anchor in God. <laughs> But I should, because he's the only one that won't move. His perspective of me doesn't change. His love for me doesn't change. And he can pull me through. He can hang on to me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm mixing metaphors here, but, but he's the rock that I can stand on. So Jason, for those that, um, you know, that are still doubting, are still anxious, are still unsure about um, what the future holds, um, how can we find this hope, you know, and then this certainty um, that you are talking about and, you know, this anchor um, that you have just shared with us? Yeah, that's a great question, Rio. Um, if you have never done this before, um, this might be the time for you to do this. Um, the Lord is asking each of us to make a decision about whether or not we're going to follow Jesus or not. And in following Jesus, we have to give up everything, but we actually gain back everything. The Lord becomes our king and we surrender to him all that we have and we receive from him the inheritance that he offers. Um, I love the verse in, in John 3.16. You probably know it, but I'll read it again. Um, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God sent Jesus for situations like this. So that when we have the whole world coming down around us, 
we can recognize that it's only in God that we can find our anchor and turn to him and place the anchor with him. And then he promises to rescue us. And, and you might be feeling that call today. Um, in, in Revelation 3.20, I love this verse. It says, uh, Jesus talking. It says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens it, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. And so if you feel Jesus asking you today to let him into your life, to allow him to take control of your life, um, I ask that you would do that and that you would rejoice in that newfound freedom and love and life that you have with, with Jesus. If you would like to make this decision today, um, here's a prayer I'd like to pray with you. And um, you can pray this aloud and, uh, and really reflect on the words that it says. Um, it's it's a way for you to allow Christ to uh, to enter your life and, and take control. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for loving me. Jesus, I confess that I have sinned against you, but thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Today, I put my trust in you as my Lord and my Savior. I accept your free gift of eternal life, and I surrender my life to you. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins. From this day on, I choose to follow you. Amen. So thank you. If you've prayed this prayer, um, feel free to reach out to, uh, to a facilitator uh, who would love to follow up with you about the next steps you can take. Thank you, Jason. So let's, um, shall we go move on to our Q&A? So we have a, uh, a lot of questions here, and uh, one of the questions that we picked out was from our friend MJ. She's asking, I am single and still in the accumulating phase in my financial journey. How can I make the most of my potential and take advantage of the time that I have? That's a great question, MJ. Um, you're actually in a really good spot because you can pivot so easily. Um, Right now, even though you're in the period of accumulation, you might have a slower time of accumulation, depending on what happens with your work. Uh, but I really want, to, uh, I would encourage you to put emphasis on, um, on especially the, uh, the protecting phase. Um, what I mean by pivot is, is really, you can easily cut costs and change direction. Um, you haven't signed up your kids already for, for little league or, or whatever other expenses come from, from having a family, you really are able to, to make decisions quickly. And so I'd encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, invest into your marketability. Um, you might not have a lot of job experience yet. I certainly don't, but you can definitely put a lot of work into uh, how you present yourself to possible employers. Um, look into those courses that were just mentioned. Great idea. Um, also in terms of uh, financially, for sure, keep putting money aside as much as you can. Um, Make sure that you have a good um, emergency fund because you don't know what's going to happen. But with those ex other additional expenses that you cut, definitely put some of those that money into the markets. Also, look at opportunities you have with this time that you that you have available to you. Um, it is very it, there's a big temptation just to uh, use the extra time on Netflix or on Facebook or Instagram, but you really want to make sure that you're putting this time to good use. A great, there might be some really good opportunities. Um, I'm not sure if you're involved in your church, but there might be some really good opportunities to be involved in your church in discipling people or in helping with new ministries or new outreaches. Um, remember, just, just remember that um, a great way to handle your time well is to organize it well. So having a good schedule, putting things in order, and, and, and achieving the goals that you want to set out for yourself. That's something I've been doing a lot of in scheduling my days, having a plan before I start each day. And then uh, evaluating, you know, why I didn't hit my goals if I didn't, or, or rejoicing in how I was able to achieve some of my goals. I, I think from, a, from the eternal perspective, again, looking beyond just this life, I think there is really an importance in looking at how does God want you to use your singleness and your freedom to really honor him. I think that you need to really come to the Lord in prayer and say, God, like, where I'm at right now, are there people that you want me to reach out to? People that I can serve, that I can maybe help out. Maybe my friend uh, isn't in the same help, my uh, good position that I am in. Maybe I can offer them a hand or maybe um, help them out with some expenses. Really 
take this time to shine uh, the light of Christ uh, in, in your neighborhood, in your community, and, and help other people get to know his love. A, um, a follow-up question, Jason, is a more technical one, is when you say emergency fund, how much usually is that? You have no idea how often I got that question mark in my financial meetings. It, it's a really good question and you'll find a lot of information online. Also, a lot of the stuff that I'm saying, guys, I didn't come up with this. You can find out for yourself uh, searching this stuff. Emergency fund is something I like to actually speak on because it's a really, really important thing that's often misunderstood. Um, you'll see most of the time online, you'll see people recommending a three to six month expenses or income that you put aside. Uh, that's not wrong, but I think that what's more important is to tailor and customize your emergency fund to match your needs. So some characteristics about an emergency fund is that the money needs to be available ASAP. So you need to be able to, in an emergency, have access to money. Uh, and so, you know, for me, I do have a bit of money I can put onto my credit card if need be. And so I don't need to carry a lot of cash on me. But I want to make sure that I have money in an account where I can access it within a few days to pay off that credit card and cover my expenses. Um, what's more important though is to say in my situation, what is like, let's say a worst case scenario and how do I prevent that? So from, again, I'm, I'm talking about myself because each person you need to look at your own life. But I like to say for me, if I lose my job and in this economy, it's not going to be maybe just like a one month, two month, three month to find a new job. It might take six months, eight months, nine months. So if I am nine months unemployed, how do I get through that? And so of course you'll cut a lot of expenses. You might downsize whatever, but you need to say, okay, how many expenses do I need to cover that much time without having to go dig into my RSPs or my GICs or things like that. You don't want to wreck those investments you've made. You don't want to have to sell your house necessarily. You might, maybe the guys want you to but but that's another question um the more important thing is what do you need to do to protect yourself in those situations another type of emergency that could happen is and this is really relevant with regards to uh, coronavirus um though maybe not with social distancing but let's say there's a death in the family or an emergency back home where you need to get get, get back to your family um, maybe your family's in canada maybe they're in the philippines maybe they're elsewhere but if you needed to book a flight right away or something like that or if you need to support someone who also loses the job, those are expenses you also want to take into account. So I would probably recommend for myself um, that I have sufficient funds to get me to uh, one of my family members should they enter into a period of extreme difficulty or even death, um, as well as attack onto that, um, probably in my position, probably a four to five month um, emergency expenses, right? And so whatever that number comes right into the math, let's say it's like $5,000, $6,000. If I have the ability, if I don't have the ability to reach that, that's fine, just go for less. But you wanna put that money into a short-term savings account where there's no risk, where the money is available to you. Ideally, you'll get some interest on that, but that's not the goal. The goal is for it to be liquid or accessible. So go speak to your uh, financial advisor or even call them on the phone and just ask about if there's an account that works for you for that. And then take a look at where your money is and if you have the ability to put that aside now or if you can work towards putting that aside soon. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, um, that's the first time I heard using our credit card, which is um, quick access to capital. Um, can you speak more about being wise with that sort of debt? Yeah, um, credit cards are, I don't like to call them debt because it gives the idea that we should keep money on the credit card. Mm -hmm. Never, never build a balance in our credit card, pay them off. Every, I, I say this knowing that there are times when life hits us and we can't and that's okay, right? Don't beat yourself up, but as much as possible, those are not built for debt, those are built for convenience. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing about credit cards, usually you have about 30 days before your bill comes due or before the payment is due. And so they're very nice just to kind of bridge that period of time. So for example, if um, I have a major purchase and my money is in a specific savings account where if I hold on to it for another five days, I'll get a bit more interest than it would if I took it out today. I might do that and then in five days I cover that cost and I never pay any interest to the bank. Mm. Um, but the interest on in those cards is enormously high, 20%, uh, even go up to 30% a year 
which is a lot of money each month that you're paying out just to keep money on a credit card. And so again, you want to avoid that as much as possible. If you have built up credit card debt and you are paying a lot each month in interest, um, there are solutions possibly for that. Um, you should talk to your banker, ask them about a restructuring, which is a possibility to maybe change that credit card debt into a loan and therefore reduce the interest that you're paying each month on that. Um, but it depends on a variety of factors. Again, talk to your financial advisor about the options that you have. Thank you, Jason. At least um, we know there's options available for us. Yeah. I like what you said there. That's uh, a new, I've never heard that before, that credit cards are built for, for convenience and not debt. It's, and that's not really the way generally we think of credit cards is it's money that were borrowed. We accumulate interest because we can't pay it yet, but really good to, to hear that different perspective for, from you. Um, we do have another question um, from, this is from Jayvoy. And just to give you a background on Jayvoy, Jayvoy is married and has two young kids. So I think it's, it's just um, apt that he's um, asked this question. And so he said, I heard that um, the best time to invest is during recessions. Um, what do I need to do to be in the best position to invest right now? That's a really good question. Um, thank you for asking it. I liked, um, I liked what Mark said earlier about the priorities. I don't remember them. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at short-term memory. But you really do want to make sure that your bases are covered. And so what this means, um, because you have a family, um, you might have a mortgage, you might have other expenses, you really want to make sure that if, you know, things happen, that you are covered. So this means um, ensuring that before you start investing, that, that you are in a stable financial position, okay? Uh, again, we can only go so far in protecting ourselves and we need to be trusting the Lord in that too. But I would encourage that uh, before you make the decisions to, uh, to put money into the markets, even though it might be a really good time, that you're not gonna then lose something more important. So again, the whole protecting aspect comes in really importantly here. But the pulling forward is talking about investing in a good time. And this is something that might be really wise to do. Uh, I can't share enough how important it is to only invest in ways that you are comfortable and that you have experience. Um, a lot of people say, oh, now I'm going to become a stock trader. It's probably not wise for a lot of us to do that. Uh, and so, but maybe this is a chance for you to take some extra time and read up on what that looks like, understand how the markets work. Um, I would encourage you to talk to your financial advisor about what products are available to you. Um, there are some really wonderful new products called uh, exchange traded funds or ETFs that are usually very uh, cheap that I would encourage you to look at. But again, this is after all the bases are covered. Um, at that point, because the markets have dropped down, uh, investor sentiment is that um, things are not going to go very well. And while this might be true, it still means that if you have, uh, if you don't have needs for another five, ten years, it might be a good time to put that money into the markets. Um, whenever you invest into the stock markets, you want to be investing for longer term goals, not shorter term goals. If you need the money in two or three years to buy a house, it's probably not wise to put into the markets. Talk to your banker, there's probably other available opportunities for you. But if you don't need the money for a while, and this is say, say you're saving for your retirement, for example, um, it is a great time to buy in if you have that extra cash or extra capital. And I would encourage you to um, put it in slowly uh, the reason for this is that let's say, I don't know, maybe tomorrow or next week or next month, the markets might take another uh, drop. Maybe over a week, it could drop 20, 30 percent. And then you'll be feeling really dumb because you put your money into the markets and it crashed. I felt that way a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But what I would encourage is that if you put in slowly, you might lose a bit of money on that. But remembering that your horizon is beyond this pandemic, it's beyond this emergency. And so it's going to be five, 10 years, your money's going to come back. It's fine. And so put it in slowly, though. So that if that does happen, maybe 20% will drop, but then you'll be able to buy more in at a much cheaper rate. And so just keep your head on your shoulders. Don't put in more than you can afford. It's not time for that. Don't, uh, don't take out debt to put money into the markets. It's a really bad idea. Um, but in general, uh, just think wisely on that. Whenever I see the word invest, I, that's my favorite word. Um, I think 
I think my quote on LinkedIn is that not every investment is a financial one, or at least most investments aren't financial ones. Most investments that we make are actually relational. So yeah, we have our finances, but we actually have our relationships as well. And so I think that uh, while I do want to speak to the financial, because I think that's what you're talking about, I want to just remind you of the investment that you could be making in your children's lives right now. Um, my best memories of my childhood when my dad would, would take me to a hockey game and we'd drive for a couple hours and we'd just talk about life and he would, he would share with me and we would learn together. Um, I've got other, other memories of my mom taking time to, to cut my hair. I mean, my haircuts are my mom's cuts. Uh, I remember um, times that we would just be together as a family playing games or watching movies or just, um, just sharing, or reading the Bible together too and, and just spending time in that. Invest into your relationships with your family. Invest into relationships with, with your community. Maybe there's a friend that you know who is really having a hard time as well. Uh, and then finally, invest into your relationship with the Lord. Spend time with Him. And we've touched on this, but again, I reemphasize: spend time with the Lord, and 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 He will, yeah, show you that He is really what you need. Um, I think the third point I want to mention on this about investing is that, and going back a bit to the financial aspect, is that we, when you're a Christian, you realize that the money that you have is not your own; it's the Lord's, and God wants us to be good stewards of our money. And so this means that, yeah, you definitely put money into the market, save for your retirement. Those things are good. But also think about how the Lord might be asking you to give with your money. Um, the return on an eternal scale looks at lives changed. It doesn't look at how many moments you got to spend on a vacation resort or how many cars you bought. The Lord looks at, at lives changed. He looks at love given. And so think of, of, of the money that you have, both as an opportunity to invest in the markets, but also as an opportunity to invest into the Lord's market, into the Lord's economy. And when you put into the Lord's economy, he has so many wonderful investments available to you. Be wise in what you do. Again, make sure your bases are covered. But the Lord might be asking you to trust him with your money and trust him with, your, with, your, with what the Lord has done with your finances. He might be leaving you with your job so that you can then help someone else who doesn't have a job and demonstrate the Lord's love and grace to you by giving grace and love to others. Um, I could go on for ages about this, but definitely don't say, hey, this is a tough time. I don't need to worry about helping other people. Rather, this is the most important time to be helping other people. And uh, yeah, if you guys have further questions on, on giving, I can talk about that for hours. So, on to our third question. It's from our friend Noriel. He says, I am 15 to 20 years away from retirement. How do I protect my investments from possible future recessions before I retire? How can I make sure I live my retirement to the fullest? That's a great question. I, I wish I was 15 to 20 years from retirement. <laughs> no, it, it really is a good question. Um, the hard thing right now is that, and this is really important for people who maybe are one year away from retirement or five years away from retirement, is that probably the money that you put aside for retirement has taken a blow recently. You're probably down 10%, 15%, 20% even this year. And that can be really scary. So I think one thing, um, talk to your financial advisor about ways that you can, uh, that, that you can um, kind of make up for that gap that might be there. Uh, probably what they're going to say is put more money aside, which might not be what you're looking to hear. <laughs> but maybe there might be ways that you can also reduce costs and, and find some a bit more to put in there. But I think most importantly, uh, and this is something that's essential um, once you hit five years to retirement or seven years to retirement, is to start the transition away from uh, excessively risky investments to moderately risky investments. Um, oh, sorry, I don't mean to say excessively, just, just risky investments to moderately risky investments. Um, uh, this is often a mix, uh, usually mutual funds or ETFs that are a mix between uh, fixed income related, so bonds or mortgages related income to more, um, sorry, from more risky like stocks to more income related. That's usually what the advisor will share with you. But if you are managing your investments yourself, usually you want to be looking at uh, probably building up more in defensive style companies, companies that will be more related to industries that don't take as much of a hit during a recession. So for example, um, I'm not sure what, 
what you, I think Loblaws is, is across the country. So Loblaws has actually done quite well in this whole pandemic because everyone is starting to cook from home. <laughs> everyone who used to eat out is now starting to eat in. So they've done really well. Costco's done really well. Those are defensive style companies. A less defensive style company would be a company that is, um, say, more, um, yeah, let, let's say uh, Air Canada. Air Canada has not done very well in this crisis because they've gone through a drop off of all their flights and everything. So they, they, they've done really poorly. And so building your investments, as you always should be doing, towards areas that offer you a mix of different types of companies. So if a crisis does happen, you don't see all your investments go down, just a portion of them. It's called having a diversified portfolio. How do you make sure you, you live my retirement, you live your retirement to the fullest? Um, preparing well, coming back to the first step of preparing. And this, this is important, uh, especially for you because you still have a wide ways to go before retirement. But preparing well for your retirement is really important. So I mentioned preparing financially, prepare financially well. Uh, make sure you have enough money, talk to your advisor, look at what it looks like to, to um, have the money you need to go into retirement. But even more importantly, prepare your relationships well. They sadly say that there's a number of marriages that go through a divorce once people have a big life change. So this could be when the children move out or this could be when you retire. And the reason for this is because for years, the couple has not invested into each other and into their marriage, but rather they've invested either solely into their children or into their jobs or other things. Um, those are all good things, but, but don't forget the priorities. You need to prioritize your family. You need to prioritize your spouse. And so now, even now, look at your spouse again and say, hey, you know, we haven't had a good talk in a while, or I haven't actually forgiven you about these things. I've just stopped talking about them discuss this together and find a solution. I'm not married. I, you guys probably know a lot more than I do about marriage, but I know my, my parents work with organizations that do um, family counseling and marriage counseling. It might be a wise thing to do, especially during this crisis, to get counseling, to take some time and look for that. I know there's a lot of resources online, more and more, especially now during this crisis that are free. Um, a lot of churches, I'm not sure if CCF offers this, maybe it's something they might offer in the future, but um, family counseling, uh, marriage counseling, uh, family retreats, things like that. I, I think that's so, so essential. And then I think um, preparing yourself spiritually and mentally for retirement is very important. So speaking with the Lord and saying, God, what does retirement look like in your eyes? What do you want for my retirement? I think for me, like I would love to have a retirement where I get to spend time with friends, where I get to go golfing, where I get to um, go on vacations, things like that. But the more I spend my time with God and realizing those are good things, I, I do want to include those in my retirement. But also I, I want to be active still. I don't want to say that's it, I'm done with my life. I want to keep building into and pouring into my family, my grandkids. I also want to be building into um, my neighbors, my friends, who are probably a lot closer to the end of their life than they were before. They don't have a lot more time to discover Jesus. I want them to know Jesus. I want to be investing into younger people, people who have yet to follow my footsteps, helping them walk through their marriage troubles or helping them lead their kids well, helping them get their first jobs. Um, and I want to really be walking with the Lord and praying. Uh, there is a, a great book. Um, of course, now I'm going to forget the name. Maybe I can, I can send you the name later, but there's a great book where it was talking about how physically we all deteriorate. Even the strongest person, the most fit person will deteriorate. Um, i trying to remember the name, sorry. Um, the second aspect is mentally, of course, we'll deteriorate as well, but spiritually we don't have to deteriorate. We can continue investing into our walk with the Lord and investing into prayer with the Lord. We can continue uh, doing all these things with passion because the Lord is our rock and the Lord stays strong. And so even as we fail physically and mentally, spiritually, we can continue to grow and continue to grow in strength and the depth of our love uh, with Jesus. Yeah, lo lots of good resources that um, we have heard today. We will try to find a way to send it out um, to those who are interested. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, you know, how, how we will uh, send out um, our kind of the summary and uh, the details of our webinar today. Um, please, um, we will post um, 
contact details for CCF. So if you have any questions, would like to reach out, um, we will post the email available for you to reach out. Um, and I think at this time, then we would um, just really like to thank um, uh, Jason for uh, joining us today, sharing lots of your expertise, but also being very um, vulnerable and sharing some of your very intimate and personal experiences. So thanks for that, Jason. Thanks to Mark as well, who has spent his time with us and given us lots of resources and lots of wisdom too, um, as we've really talked about the topic of thriving through the storm, how to weather a Canadian recession. Um, yeah, let's thank you to Ria as well. Let's give her a applause right here. Yes, put your applauses in your um, Zoom call. Um, you know, we, we were really glad we were able to do our first one. Stay tuned um, for any other upcoming webinars and um, that CCF Vancouver will be putting together. We'd love to hear from you. Once again, please do keep in touch through our email. And um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Thank you, Mark.